Good evening and welcome to another session for the New Jersey City University Department of Ed Tech Spring Webinar Series. We are going to be hearing from Isaiah Gomez tonight, who is a doctoral candidate in Cohort 7, and he's going to be presenting us on a, ver a variety of modalities for instructional delivery. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it on over to uh, Isaiah so he can begin his presentation and we're excited to hear from him. Hello, how's, how's everyone doing? Uh, let me share my screen and then we can begin. Okay. Here we go. So, hi, my name is Isaiah Gomez. I will be presenting this evening. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, uh, I'll be presenting in uh, remote, hybrid, and in-person, how to do it best. But before I begin the presentation, I want to uh, give a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I've been in education since 2007 as an executive director in early childhood education. I have also been a science teacher from uh, fourth through eighth grade. I've also done uh, middle school science. Uh, supplemental instruction for K through eighth math and reading. Currently, I'm an administrator in a uh, middle school. Uh, and um, it's been quite a challenge this year. <laughs> but however, um, doing this, I also have a master's degree in urban education from New Jersey City University, a bachelor's degree in sociology from Amherst College of New Jersey. I'm presently a doctoral candidate for education technology and leadership at uh, New Jersey City University. My hope is that I can use all these experiences uh, to bring a more positive uh, learning environment where students, faculty, and staff can thrive. All right. So uh, tonight, uh, my main focus is to uh, talk about how effectively to use in-person learning, hybrid learning, and remote learning. This is important for two reasons, okay? For one, students are learning in different areas. Because they're learning in different areas, uh, they have to manage three different aspects at the same time. Two, the current global crisis has caused the educational communities to leapfrog into technology. Schools must now use multiple technologies. Before, some schools barely used any technology but now they're having a whole onslaught of technology to use on top of the regular daily curriculum. All right. And now as educators, teachers, uh, principals, superintendents have a decision that needs to be made in choosing which option will better fit the needs of their school. This presentation is focused more towards the kindergarten through 12th grade schools on assessing their option and selecting the best modality to use. This is meant to encourage further, further research for each model. And if it suits the need of the school or the district, they may implement it. Okay, currently the, the agenda, if you go to uh, all the uh, media outlets, uh, one is either bashing the other, you know, either remote is not doing enough, uh, in-person is not too safe, uh, hybrid is just confusing. However, each model has their benefits of learning. It is not one fits all scenario. Some schools may have more than one modality occurring. As we go forward, I will briefly explain each modality, the steps one may choose to use if they would like to implement, and some success stories. Okay, so the first one that we're going to focus on tonight is in-person learning. So in-person learning is an instructional method where course content and learning materials are taught in a group of students. This allows for uh, live instruction between a uh, learner and instructor. It is more traditional type of learning instruction, um, which we have seen most of our lives, okay? Learning benefits a greater level of interaction with uh, other fellow students, as well as face-to-face -face learning. Students are held accountable for their progress as the class specific meeting date and time. Face-to-face -face learning ensures the better understanding and recollection of lesson content and gives class members a chance to bond with one another. However, this can, uh, this can be achieved with the other modalities. You can do the same with remote. You can do the same with uh, hybrid. Okay, so what is hybrid? 
Hybrid learning is a learning method that involves both in-person and virtual. Okay, so this, this is like when you're putting two of these together. This method combines both synchronous and asynchronous method to create a flexible learning environment. Students should be engaged in learning activities outside of face-to-face -face class time, whether there is a, through, a thorough independent study or online discussion. Contents of asynchronous class time are presented in a medium that allows the student to engage with the content anytime they want. For example, an instructor can stream live in-person lectures or they can stream it later and record it and share it with their students. Hybrid learning should create a singular learning experience between two formats, okay? And I'm gonna share with you um, some of the uh, benefits, okay, of hybrid learning. And one of them are uh, flexible learning experience for students and instructors. So you have that flexibility if you know you can't be there. Maybe you could send it to the student if they're sick or if they're absent. Uh, synchronous communication opportunities, okay? You could be synchronous at the same time but on different planes, different parts of the country. Freedom of independent academic exploration. Okay, so you can do different types of learning. Okay, some can learn a, a college degree or get a, a bachelor's, or if you wanna go into lower grades, I have some students who actually jumped from uh, junior, senior into college year by going through this uh, synchronously. And there's more effective use of resources. But before we go further, I wanted to explain, because uh, this sometimes gets uh, put together, blended learning and hybrid learning. There's a, there's a difference between the two. So the key differentiator between blended learning and hybrid learning is the relationship between in-person and online learning. In blended learning, like this picture here, okay, additional resources like videos, articles, podcasts are more meant to enhance the in-person classes and create an enriched learning experience. On the other hand, hybrid is a little bit different because online learning is meant to replace an element of in-person class. Materials shared asynchronously is considered part of the main lesson, not just a complementary additive. The online material is an alternative to in-person material and is meant to create a flexible learning experience. Now remote learning okay, is a juggernaut. Remote learning is simply put where the students or teachers or educator are not physically present in the traditional classroom. Rather, instruction is disseminated through technology tools such as discussion boards, video conferencing, virtual assessments in an attempt to recreate the in-person face-to-face classroom over the internet. Unlike its close relative, okay, we, we could also confuse this with virtual learning which virtual learning is more official established mode of online learning. Remote education involves teachers and students who are not accustomed to education that takes place online. So right now, all the, the schools from, well, most of the schools that are normally in a brick and Mozart building um, that chose remote are remote learning because typically they will use their curriculum in the classroom. And that curriculum, which is meant for in-classroom learning is now being, shared remotely. So that's why it's known as remote learning. And this typically occurs during scheduling conflicts, illnesses, or like today, disasters. Uh, this particularly newness of remote learning then is what makes it tricky for both educators and students. Okay, so that's, that's some of the things that we have, the discussion boards, the virtual assessments, all right. Um, and then as, as we go forward, I want to explain some of the benefits of uh, that we could receive from each and every one of these models. Uh, educators need to know how best to decide what is the best course of action. Uh, each model has their benefits. Uh, so as we review, we're gonna look at in-person learning. So with in-person learning, there's peer interaction that is heightened in the in-person learning environment. Students can meet their teachers face-to-face -face, as well as establish relationships with their classmates to some level. Learning is more interactive, group oriented. The connectivity will not be the same, will not be an issue. For example, the internet will not go out. If a family does not have internet, okay, it's okay. They can still go to class. Lunches are provided for. Uh, children can work in the environment geared for learning. Many special needs in early child education will receive the attention that is needed 
in the classroom. Students can develop socially and emotionally uh, while in school. And also you have administrators, you have teachers who at, at a moment's at an arm's reach uh, to help them out. So that's, one of, that's some of the benefits of in-person learning. Hybrid learning, uh, and this, this, this is not meant to compare which one is better. As I said before, this is meant to see uh, kind of like a puzzle. How does it fit into the school? How can we use it best for the school or the district? Uh, so, so keep that in mind. The benefits of hybrid learning are numerous from providing greater access to education uh, to catering to different learning styles simultaneously in helping to alleviate some of the problems associated with student absenteeism. Uh, it is only through uh, understanding these various benefits that you can start to understand why hybrid learning is emerging such as an important concept. Okay. Um, with remote learning, you can manage uh, assignments on your own time with recordings or lectures, uh, personalize your learning paths. In the case of K through 12, learning on your own term encourages you to take the responsibility uh, without teacher watching your every move, which may even give students a head start for college. Okay. Uh, so, Okay, so before we go into this, um, I would like uh, for everyone to just uh, like, like we do mostly in school, we take a little break, right? It's been like a few minutes <laughs> and we take a stretch and we stretch our arms and we go up and we move and say, okay, let's breathe, right? Because sometimes, uh, especially with younger students, uh, especially fourth and fifth, their attention span has now shifted to across the room if they're at home or uh, another another brother and sister they're hearing their lecture instead <laughs> so uh, so th this time we normally cut for a break all right uh, so now what I wanted to go into now is the strategies for in person and that's that, that's a little example of one of the strategies maybe you'll do a dance maybe you do uh, something that will kind of alleviate and take the the pressure off being honed into this narrow little square or rectangle. Okay, so in-person strategy. What are some in-person strategies? Um, I assume that everyone here has some form of uh, uh, edu uh, education experience, which means that you have been through a traditional in-person lesson. Um, right now, that has taken a back seat. Okay, although we want to return back to the ways of old, uh, the current time will not allow it to be so. I cannot mention this, this section without discussing the uh, current crisis, right? Coronavirus, there I said it, right? Uh, this has big implications. Now school districts are itching up uh, to open up, but the question is how? The answer is not all schools are the same. Not all school districts have the same capabilities, capacity or population of students. Resources will play a key part and as well as a good plan, all right? Um, testing and vaccines. Are an, are an X factor. That's the big this discussion now. Um, will everyone be tested? However, can students and teachers become vaccinated in time and will this bring things back to normal? Hopefully, but thankfully not because we have found new techniques that have actually helped some students excel through this time of remote and hybrid. The key is to change the traditional in-person learning to a new improved in-person learning. Okay, I like to call this uh, in-person 2.0. And this section uh, is in regards to schools that are applying to return 100% in-person with no hybrid in mind. Uh, in the case of remote students that they offer for, for remote that can be taught, uh, but maybe, maybe asynchronously at a different level with a different teacher. Of course, there are many factors to, to consider, uh, but for the sake of everyone here, for the sort, but for the sake of this presentation, we're going to hone it to three, which is uh, safety, technology, and pedagogy. So, this is all in consideration also with the time that we're in now, um, which at, before you have more leeway. Now, when students are coming off from being remote and being hybrid to being in the classroom 100%, the engagement is much different. Okay, first of all is safety, all right? The first thing to mention is that safety is a big component to the return. Social distancing is still a key aspect to the learning. Before we can group, before we, we group 30 students in one classroom side by side, but right now that cannot happen. 
Students and teachers must be socially distanced three to six feet apart when applicable. If the status of the CDC continues in the same progression, things may be the same to some degree. Masks will still need to be worn. Physical education may need to be adjusted to non-physical activities. It all will depend on the future and what the outcomes are. But students and faculty may have to test monthly or close contact positive tests will resolve protocols will be enforced. So all these things will happen in place. This is the, the knowledge that, uh, especially now, um, my current situation, I'm in the uh, middle school and we're a uh, hybrid and I'm there every day. And we, that's the first step is the CDC protocols, making sure that we meet all uh, these, these uh, plans of emergency, emergency operation plans and everything has to be up to date, all right? Uh, we have to promote behaviors. So aside from the regular curriculum, there's the safety cu curriculum. And uh, we have in place a committee that we meet weekly and we discuss this. We, we, we discuss how do we improve, how do we reach out to parents, how do we get information to parents about the uh, policies and procedures. The other thing is adequate su supplies. Um, speaking with the um, PSA, with the, with the parent student committee, in which we come up with some fundraisers to, 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 to provide these supplies, PPE. Uh, signs and messages, remind visitors also and school protocols, because sometimes you get an aunt and uncle who have not been to the school and they're rushing to the door with no mask on, you have to stop them in the chest, say, oh, mask, and ask them the, the questions. And for most cases in most schools, they cannot enter those buildings. All right, so maintaining a healthy environment and healthy operations, making sure everything is pristine and all regulations are followed. Okay, that's the first step. The next one is uh, technology. As we return to in-person learning, integrating technology is key to prepare students for the future. Technology integration depends on the kind of technology available and how much access one has to technology. The definition also depends on who is using the technology. For, for instance, in a classroom with only an interactive whiteboard and one computer, learning will still remain teacher-centered and integration will, will revolve around the teacher's needs, which are not necessarily student needs but still there needs to have some type of interactive interactivity that revolves around the students. Even with one computer in a room, there will always be, there was always a way to integrate your students and put them first. And, and that's the point that, that we wanna to get to, to get to a seamless integration where the uh, lesson and everything comes together without the thought process of using the technology. Uh, that's what I was going to about the 2.0, uh, going back into the classroom, but with the technology, because the idea is what got us into the big confusion and the big uh, uh, hiccup back in March was that many schools were not prepared. And uh, that digital divide that, that happened between the schools, especially in the urban areas, is what caused a lot of headaches. So having this seamless integration in the schools will help out currently now, will push further the agenda of uh, transmitting the, uh, 20, the to 21st century skills and get them better prepared for the future. However, in order to do this, some questions need to be asked. Okay, for example, uh, what skills are being applied to, to nearly all the tools? Um, do they know how to save a file, how to name a file, how to find a file, how to log into the accounts? All right, uh, do, do the students uh, know how to understand the technology better? Uh, would have pushed them deeper into the understanding that cannot be achieved without technology. What level of integration do you want your classroom by the end of the year to achieve? What specific steps must you take to achieve that goal? What is the realistic goal? So some of these questions is, is what has to be asked when you're trying to integrate the technology. Technology integration is the use of, of resources, computers, mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, digital cameras, uh, social media platforms, networks, uh, all these in daily classroom practices and in the management of a school. Successful technology integration is achieved when the use of technology is routine, transparent, accessible, readily available for the task at hand, supporting the curricular goals and helping the student to achieve, uh, to achieve their goals. When technology integration is at its best, a child or teacher doesn't stop or think about what they're doing with the technology tool. It's a second nature thing. 
and the student are often more actively engaged into projects with, with, with the technology and are seamless part of the learning process. So one of the techniques, one of the frameworks, and you may have seen this in, in the past, and uh, it may have fallen back into the technology integration specialist book a couple of years ago, if your school was in that position, um, was the SAMR. Uh, and this and this model, uh, the substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition model was created by Paul, by Dr. Ruben Pentendua, and guides the process of reflecting on how we are integrating technology into our classrooms. The ultimate goal of the technology integration is to completely redefine how we teach and learn. So that's the whole point of in-person 2.0, to redefine how we teach and learn, and to do things that we've never could before with the technology in our hands, all right? Uh, another one is uh, the uh, TPAC, and the TPAC is a techno technological pedagogical content knowledge. Framework lays out the knowledge that educators need in order to successfully integrate technology into their teaching. The TPAC website provides a large collection of free resources for teachers and other instructional leaders. Um, like I said, this alone, these two alone, you could spend another two hours talking about these and having sessions. Um, but I do encourage them uh, to, to research and learn more about these if you don't know already. Uh, because both of these um, frameworks um, bring together how well and how much are we using the technology? Is it a sparse use? Is technology really used in the classroom? Is it just maybe uh, an ornament? Or is it basically used? Technology being used available occasionally when you have a lab? Or comfortable when technology is used in the classroom on a regular basis? Students are comfortable with a variety of tools and are often use these tools to create projects. And then there's seamless. Seamless meaning students employ technology daily. The classroom is used a variety of tools to complete assess assignments and create projects at a deep understanding of the content. Despite the dramatic differences in resources and abilities from classroom to classroom or school to school, it is possible to integrate technology tools in ways that can impact engagement and learning for all students. All right. Um, and for an, a prime example, and we've all seen this before at some point, is Google Classroom. Right? Google Classroom is not something new, it's been around for, many, for about almost a decade. Um, but it's a good example as to use maybe in all technology. Uh, and this can expand further. So for example, if you were teaching geography or social studies and you wanted to look and we talk about the globe, then you could talk about the globe, how the world is more a spherical form. And you can go and talk about that and you can show them that this is a satellite image of the earth. Some other tools um, for using is like a smart board, something that's also old, but I brought this up because it's something that we've most of us have seen. Um, most of us have seen this in our classroom. Sometimes we watch movies on them, you know, sometimes we write on them, <laughs> but uh, they have a different purpose. And here I list some of the things that we can do with them. For example, a digital story. Uh, if you have a book and maybe you have an Elmo and you connect it to the computer, put it on the you know, smart board, you can use it as a digital storytelling device for everyone in the classroom and for those who are possibly, possibly hybrid or remote. Creating and viewing and annotating students, PowerPoint, multimedia presentation in real time, showing streamed and downloaded videos, which is the popular one, using online map and satellite imagery, like I just showed you, displaying artwork, or online museum presentations. So I've done this myself, showing artwork that maybe we cannot see at a museum. Demonstrating movie making techniques, doing and analyzing competitive sports or physical education activities. Um, at, at one point I showed our origami, how to make an origami. And um, you can see step-by-step, step, oh, pause, rewind, pause, rewind. These are some of the techniques that you can do. Uh, teaching students how to conduct research on the internet, right? So, working collaboratively or writing, editing, exercising, math lessons. So the list goes on and on and on, all right? However, with in-person, and we've all have experienced this, at some point, hardware and equipment will tend to fail. This is an inevitable part of the tech integration, and it's often a number one fear for classroom teachers everywhere. And um, I have done um, many observations now, and this has occurred this year, that the technology failed. The Wi-Fi went out, computer died, 
the main key of, of all this is to have a backup plan, a non-technology backup plan. Um, just like if you were absent and you had the, the, the substitution folder, the backup plan is important as well. Just as we always tell our students that failure is okay, that we learn from failure, that failure is part of the learning process. And so must we as adults follow our own advice, model troubleshooting with other students, uh, report the problem, know who to report the problem to, ask for help, have someone who knows how to fix the problem show you for the next time. Okay, another part for the, for the in-person is digital citizenship. Now this goes across across the whole stream for, for all three um, modalities. Um, our students are constantly immersed in technology, yet that does not mean that we don't know how to use it for learning. We must not always assume that they know how to use it responsibly either. We have just to teach the children how to act in the playground, in the, in the park, and we admonish students who you know, copy someone's homework. The same has to be done with the technology. Uh, and this is teaching about cyberbullying, copyright, plagiarism, digital footprints. Um, by taking small steps, teachers can begin to reap the benefits that technology can bring and uh, can take away some of the painfulness uh, that will happen in the future. However, even with the limited access and with careful planning, some risk-taking and open-minded uh, teachers can successfully use technology to enhance their teaching and bring learning to the lives of the students. Right. The next aspect is the um, pedagogy. And um, the lesson should be purposeful. Uh, as students enter into the classroom, uh, it cannot be back to where we um, have a, a full-blown lecture of students and everyone's just listening. Um, that is the old version, that's 1.0. Even though there are some instances for that, uh, having a more active lesson, especially coming from being at home and looking at the screen, having that fully engaging uh, cu curriculum is what's going to help them. So the students have to be in engaged and oriented. However, the students should be engaged as much as possible. And I will list a few tips uh, into helping. Okay, so uh, first we have, let me go back, it was the essential question. Okay, having that essential question, um, it gives teachers a direction. Remember, there's one essential question per lesson, and the students, as some of you have already known, to answer this question by the end of the lesson. This is the driving force, um, and especially in science, something that we have used, and our science teachers and some teachers in the uh, regular general pop have used it before. Um, and this allows the students to have to be able to analyze and apply. They cannot just answer the, the question with yes or no. There has to be some form of evidence to provide their answer. The next is activating strategy. So when you're activating strategy, you're thinking actively and making a connection with real world experience. One main thing to do is to show a video clip. So you can show a video clip and uh, not really let them know what it's about. So when they focus on the clip, then the teacher uses that engagement to link it to the lesson. The students will realize that their likes and interests can channel the learning and experience. Another famous one that we like all like to use is um, graphic organizers. So the graphic organizer uh, allows students to visually categorize new information and review all information. Students need to, be, to conceptualize whatever information is given to them. So the graphic organizer is another way to keep them you know, adept. And when you're in the classroom, you can also use this on their laptops in the classroom. And you can have the, the, a digital graphic organizer that they can also alter on their laptops or, or iPads. Another interesting one uh, is uh, student movement. So the student movement, we all see here, right now, if you're in school, this is not gonna happen. <laughs> no mask, walking around less than one feet apart, um, that's not gonna happen. But however, this is something that we would like to achieve in the future, all of us, to be back to this position. Uh, coming September, we may be able to even get a little bit closer with the mask on, but student movement is a must, right? Students, even if you have to go outside, um, I know that for physical education, it's, it's allowed to, 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 to move the mask if you're doing running activities. Students need to be able to be mobile at some point during instruction to ensure they are actively engaged. This is probably the most challenging for teachers because of the current situation. Another one is uh, 
limiting lectures. So like that man there, that's what happens. There should be a limited lecture time. So between 10 to 12 minutes of lecturing, uh, you should engage your students in some type of activity, even only for a few minutes. A teacher can then go back and go back to lecturing and kind of go on, kind of have a, a almost a, a stopping point. Uh, have, an example could be have students talk to their neighbor, draw a picture, write a few sentences, and then summarize or describe their lecture. One way to keep students active also is through rigor. Like these two men here, being rigorous, not in the physical sense, but in the intellectual sense. Lessons that must be rigorous, activities should be challenging and move at a brisk pace. There should be opportunities for students not to get bored, but to be engaging in the activity. The entire lesson should be active. Teachers should strive to take their students to the highest level of their knowledge. Another point is less of us and more of them. It should be student-centered. The lessons should be um, focused on the instruction of their students that they demonstrate what they have learned or what they're focused on. The use of technology is a tool to, critical, to a critical component of this. It provides students with 21st century skills that are both engaging and relevant to real world application. So with that being said, that's gonna close the in-person and now it's hybrid strategies. So these strategies are basic in the premise that they are engaging students who are both online and in the classroom. And one of the first things that, that you have to do in order to have that focus is to have the students in the classroom stimulated. So in-person stimulation experience is a must. The basic premise is to have them feel online as they do in the classroom. One way to do this is to having a chat, mo a chat moderator. Online students can struggle to get the teacher's attention over or more visible students in the classroom. Introverted students who are more quiet, especially in an online setting, may lose out on participation altogether. Online contributions need to carry the same weight as the person who's achieving uh, in, in the classroom. So we see here, we have some uh, moderators talking to these uh, politicians uh, beginning to speak. So the online moderator will have the, will have the opportunity to, um, to assign chats, to filter questions or other quality contributions from the online uh, platform. Already knowing what students is designed for this role, uh, you should have that in mind. That eliminates the time spent searching for an online student willing to speak and allows for a smooth transition curation of the best student and contributions. So those students who are mostly at home will be the best choice because um, they will have access to the computer in front of them. They will have less distractions that, that are, are around them if they're at home. Rotating this role among the students who attend online, potentially partnering two students per class, sessions to serve at a time if necessary. Um, it includes specific checkpoints in your PowerPoint slide or lecture notes where you will be purposefully elicited to, to modify those chats. The next one is uh, breakout rooms. So breakout rooms with deliverables. So breakout rooms allow for peer-to-peer -peer conversation online, akin to those who occur on, in live classroom. However, uh, online breakout rooms are harder to monitor than, um, let me go back, are, are, are harder to uh, monitor than in-person classroom. Have a clear deliverable will help in this. Sometimes a deliverable may be for the in-person or the online group to, to answer a specific question. That way the online students will be aware that the group's outcome are distinct and their contribution to the classroom is in, in the discussion. So maybe giving the online uh, group a different, a different question and then the in-person group a different question and having them come together to discuss this uh, through the smart board is an excellent way to integrate both in person and uh, those who are online. Uh, you can have an increased cross collaboration by having students come comment on each other's group. And as you saw right now, the interactive tools. So there's other interactive tools. Um, some use Kahoot, some use things out as polling and quizzing are good ways to engage students in the classroom and online. Most online meeting platforms have limited polling functionality in the system. However, uh, are poorly suited for children, both student in class and online option. However, everywhere, um, there are sites for free polling services that add up to a limited number of participants and enable students to ask questions that can be voted up or down. 
So as I mentioned, Koku is a popular free option that offers playful, playful competitive quizzes and encourages students on, uh, on, on some quizzes. And you get to um, you know, alter those quizzes. You can make it geared towards your lesson. Uh, you can make it also geared to whatever age group that you wanted to focus on. The other is the second approach. The second approach is to differentiate online uh, learning and engagement. Uh, rather than trying to duplicate the, the in-person online ex experience, another approach is to differentiate both of them, providing something different for the online and for the in-person. So this can be done if some students must join class virtually, you can maximize the benefits of having the students on the devices unmasked at home. One good way is having discussion leaders. So the students who are in the school will have their mask on, will be socially distanced, possibly a little farther away, a little hard to be a discussion leader. But those who are home will have a better uh, advantage. So assign a discussion leader for the day to complete prep work to stimulate students' debates and deeper inquiry. You can accomplish that by having the discussion leaders reach outside content to relevant to the day's topic and generate complimentary students and discussion questions. Then display the discussions leaders on the projector screen in the classroom where they can speak to the students and share their own screen and then prepare content as needed. So putting them in a leadership role will engage them in the classroom while they're at home. Another way of, of getting them involved is being search masters. So being a search master, since online students are, have already connected to the internet, the use of this strength and engage them in searching um, for current events on answers not found in the textbook. Make it a lighthearted competition for the fastest one to find the information is a good example. Or some small extra credit points. Okay. Another way is to have reflective summary analog, uh, analogies. Consider uh, book ending classes with the online students' reflections. So having them come together and to get the reflection on what they learned for the day. A student once summed up a class session on a workforce planning and stating, bad workforce planning is like trying to recruit more checker pieces than when your business needs to play chess. So students can come back with information and they can make these analogies uh, and it will help the other students in the classroom. Um, one thing that I also used to do is, uh, we used to do like uh, read a story at the end of the day, even with fifth and sixth graders, having a short story and read that short story, it kind of settles them into the end of the day. And this is something that could be done on the, on the uh, smart board uh, and it can be done with students who are also remote. Okay, so the next one is for remote learning strategies. All right. So one important thing, because remote is a lot of information um, and it, your computer can like some people who I know, they have their whole home screen, which is a bunch of files just plastered all over the screen. One big thing is to consolidate remote learning. All right. The longer you manage remote classes, the more remote learning lessons and materials you will accumulate. Organizing and storing all of your class resources in one place makes it easier for students to find the materials that is needed. So consolidating your learning resources also speeds up the transition, especially if students are brand new in your classroom. One method is using LMS, such as, such as Google Classroom. LMS makes it easier for any class to access material from wherever they are. You can add on to your own, change existing remote learning materials in your own LMS as your schools evolve. Another something that's new is, uh, is called um, Digital Adoption Platform. Uh, and this is one of them, it's called Intercom. And now I'll, I'll, I'll get into in, in, Intercom in a little bit. So uh, what, what, what these do that you can integrate an existing LMS and offer walkthroughs and videos to guide users through new technology and help supplement their remote learning. More importantly, DAPs, that is digital adoption platforms, okay, enable students to learn at their own pace. Uh, the guide walkthroughs an extensive self-help menu of a DAP enables students to learn on their own time and their own flow of work. So focusing more on Intercom, it's just the, one of the leading uh, applications out there. Intercom is a conversational relationship platform 
With Instacom, you can build better customer relationships through personalization, message-based experience across customer journey. So you can use this as a teacher with your parents. Um, this would be an excellent way to, to communicate to parents. Okay, that's one app. Um, another way is to use a variety of contact forms. Uh, of course, not everyone learns the same way. Everyone, some are more visual, some are more auditory, um, and prefer reading materials, while others learn better through video. Using a mixture of content format helps all of your students get the most out of the remote learning experience. Offer a mixture of articles, videos, slideshows, and interactive content, such as a webinar. Um, you could also have uh, host lunch and learn session. I think this is fun, uh, as, as you have here. One of the things uh, uh, we, we do that in, in, the, in the school uh, where, where I'm at now is that we have lunches. And I, I myself, as administrator, now participate in the lunches on um, one or two days in which we're able to eat with the students in the classroom. And when you do that, uh, there, there are some instances where the uh, camera's on and the students who are home can also participate. Now, uh, this learning doesn't always have to take place. So it could be an individual or something asynchronous. And uh, you can have a lunch and learn. And it's a remote learning strategy where the students gather via video conference and someone from your school presents the material on a specific topic. Maybe they could talk about a certain discussion. Um, by scheduling regular sessions, you provide a structured lection, uh, lesson and make sure that your students are honing in on the skills that is most important in the curriculum. Another good one uh, to do while remote is having a buddy system. Teachers juggle a lot of, of, of responsibilities and sometimes you may not have to go through the whole remote learning course. Um, each of your students answer their questions individually. Now, having a buddy system, when you, when you pair one student with the other, uh, it provides peer feedback, uh, which takes the burden off yourself going to each student, you can go to that group. And having a, a specific buddy encourages other students to finish their work and learn about the questions. Uh, knowing someone is regularly checking on your work also keeps the student accountable and pairing them shouldn't be random. So you should, should pick one who is more active and one who's less active uh, and that has some type of connection. Okay, that's the most difficult part. But once you have that, then you can have that buddy system working. All right, so now I, I wanted to focus on some success stories, um, because like I said before, each model, each, uh, each one uh, has its benefits, and I wanted to show you uh, that there are some schools that have benefited from this. So I'm going to show you clips um, from two schools that are in person. Okay, one is St. Peter and Paul and Old States Academy. Uh, give me thumbs up if you are able to hear. Students who have had minimal in-person instruction this year, local private schools have had success with their in-person plans. I would say it's been overwhelmingly successful, absolutely beyond what I really even could have imagined when we got started. Schools like St. Peter and Paul and All Saints Academy have had in-person instruction five days a week since the start of the school year and little to no community spread of COVID-19. Both schools fall under the Diocese of Joliet which let each school create its own plan. That's allowed them to be adaptable. I think what you have to do is you have to kind of think outside the box. Our students are eating lunch in their classrooms. So what we did to our lunchroom is we turned it into a junior high um, science classroom. And um, just taking some of those areas that we're not using to try and spread the kids out a little bit more uh, and to keep them safe and, uh, and allow us to have more students here in the school. Saints Peter and Paul and All Saints also use more conventional methods to mitigate spread, like hand sanitizer, masks, and spaced out desks. Both administrators said based on the success of their schools, they think in-person learning could work in public schools as well, though it would likely present different challenges with so many more students. School District 203 is on track to begin hybrid learning on January 25th, and District 204 hopes to have all students in a hybrid model by February 1st. For Naperville News 17, I'm Casey Krajewski. Okay, so now I'm going to show you another uh, school. Um, this one is from Minnesota.
This man went from homeless to millionaire so quickly, he is actually known as the open As more students in Minnesota get ready to return to the classroom, students at one West Metro High School have been there all year. Our Brett Hofflin takes us to Holy Family Catholic in Victoria, where in-person learning has been a success. This is the new normal at Holy Family Catholic High School. It's definitely a lot better, like actually getting to be in the building. Olivia is a senior, and when they moved to online learning at the end of last school year, the thought of missing out on so much this year was difficult. It got pretty lonely just staying in my room day after day during online school. But administration decided last summer to find a way to make this a reality. It has looked a little bit different. Mike Brennan is the president of the school. He says while it was easy to want to try to bring back normalcy, executing it was a different story. The work that it took and the work that we knew it would take to present an, an, an in-person learning experience for our kids was incredibly hard and incredibly challenging. But it has been a success. Brennan telling me they've had few positive COVID tests in this school of about 450 kids. Our case numbers have been, at, at worst, less than 1% of our, uh, you know, not just student, but student and adult uh, population. The principal even sends out weekly COVID-19 updates. It highlights safety reminders and stresses the only way they can maintain this in-person learning environment is to follow these steps. Maintain vigilance, and that is something that we communicate over and over again in these weekly communications. Along with required matcher checks before school, assigned seats at lunch, safety reminders, and advanced air filters, the school also created two committees to help implement the plan. Really fortunate. I feel like Holy Family is one of the schools that's given their seniors like the best senior year possible. I mean, it's definitely better than like full-time online school. While Holy Family is a smaller school, Brennan believes they can be a model to schools of all sizes who are set to return to the classroom. We are here and willing and able and ready to, to be a support. Um, Okay, so we'll stop that one. Okay, so along with this, now we have some. Wait for the connection to work. Okay. Yep. So along with in person, now we have hybrid. Okay, so with, with hybrid, we have also some success stories. Go to it. So hybrid, we have North Kansas City, which have also been successful in um, allowing uh, the hybrid of both students in the classroom and those who are at home. Please take a look. Learning model this week. 41 Actions reporter Jordan Betts talked with teachers at one Northland school about their experiences with this new method. Here's work to look at and analyze. Students are back learning in person in North Kansas City. What else do we see? The district is almost one month into their hybrid learning. Students splitting up their time between learning at home and at school. But 25% of students are fully virtual. We are prepping a lesson that we're going to teach in person and we're creating it all digitally. So we're typing out directions, we're making videos of lessons, videos of directions. Even though we identify the point of view that to help limit the spread of COVID-19, the district is limiting the movement of students. Here at Gateway, only teachers move classrooms. The kids do stay, but I, as the teacher, actually have to move. And um, I have to move to my teaching partner's room twice a day and then work with her students at their assigned seats. With other districts like Shawnee Mission moving to hybrid models for some students, these North Kansas City educators have some advice. Give yourself and give your students grace. We are all learning something new we are all trying our best um, and we just have to remember why we do it i had a kid message me at like 9 30 last night and was like can you please respond i have a question and it killed me and i was like oh this is so hard but setting aside time for yourself you need to have some time at home you don't need to be working at 10 o'clock at night click on today's work it's a whole new normal for everyone but teachers in the north kansas city school district say they want to make pandemic learning enjoyable as possible but they will 100% remember the sixth grade year with me. And so I just want to try my best to make it a year that they look back on and they don't think, 
oh my gosh, that was terrible, that was so hard, but they really see how we, we all worked together and tried new things and, you know, made it memorable and made it fun. In Kansas City, Jordan Betts, 41 Action News. This is the checkers game where grandson and... Okay, so the next um, model is for remote learning success. Uh, and this is a, this, this was one that a lot of people say re remote learning is very difficult because there's not that much interaction, at least with hybrid, you're able to go in the classroom, whatever you miss at home, you can pick it up. But there's actually been some instances where students have actually done better at home than they would have in the classroom. Okay, so please take a look. Of education reports students are still struggling this year but some have found the odd setup is actually helping them learn channel three's kevin geis explains why some students are working under all sorts of different formats when they're in the remote setting some are in their kitchen their bedroom some are right in their living room all just trying to make sure that they continue learning but it hasn't been total chaos some are figuring out how to do the remote learning and some say they like it and for a lot of students, that flexibility has allowed them to really thrive. They're not the majority, but they have made themselves stand out. As long as they're doing their work that day, they have that opportunity to do other things. Some students are finding success under a hybrid or remote learning model in ways they never have. Jennifer Bickle Hayes is a school counselor at CBU High School. She says students that are thriving are picking up everything from extra courses to college courses, extracurriculars, or extra shifts. So it's really allowed some students to find where their strengths are and really make that work for them. Bickle Hayes says it's about the freedom and flexibility, and one student agrees. For her, it's working. I feel like I learn just as well, like on remote learning as I do in like actual school. Angelique Macy is a sophomore at Spalding High School. She's been balancing the remote and hybrid learning model for almost 75% of her high school career so far. When you're at home, like when you have remote learning, you can do the work like at your own pace. And I find that a lot more helpful because I can spend like as much time as I need to on the work to fully understand it. Macy says she's been able to pick up the piano, take two extra classes outside of her high school, and put more time into art. She says at times, flexibility has even benefited her grades. Her only issue, minor miscommunication that she says was easily fixed. So although she says more flexible learning paths were never really on her mind before, now they seem realistic. But as long as someone can motivate themselves to do their work, then I feel like they can learn just as well at home as they could in school. Counselors also did point out to me that under Act 77 passed in 2013, schools are supposed to be giving students options if they want a different flexible pathway for their learning like remote learning. And now the counselors tell me families and students may be looking at alternate options more seriously for the first time. And Angelique isn't the only one who's doing really well in remote learning. I also spoke with a senior at CBU who tells me he's getting straight A pluses for the first time in his academic career. Reporting in Colchester, Kevin Geis, Channel. Okay, so now I'm going to, to open it up. I, I thank you for uh, and those who are, who are here. I'm going to open it up to uh, discussion for the question and, and answer. So if you have any questions about uh, any uh, in-person uh, strategies or, you know, thoughts uh, about it or uh, maybe a hybrid, if you have any questions on those or if you have any questions on remote, uh, I've, uh, currently my experience is uh, mainly dealing with uh, in-person, hybrid and um, uh, remote learning. Uh, I myself have also conducted uh, standardized tests remotely with about 60 students. Um, and, uh, you know, it was actually very easy. Uh, it was uh, less complicated than um, um, having in a classroom, uh, making sure, especially when uh, you have them on camera and, and, it's, and it's being uh, recorded. Uh, it seemed very, uh, very simple. The only question was, of course, the connectivity. 
So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of situations, things that happen better in certain, in certain um, uh, circumstances. So uh, if you have any questions about any of those modalities, uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask away. Hi, Isaiah, thank you for uh, sharing. I really appreciate being able to uh, listen to your presentation. Our teachers in our district are getting ready to bring our students back for the first time uh, since the pandemic hit. So it's been just over a year before our kids have been um, in school. And, uh, I, and I did hear earlier too in one of the videos that the, the one teacher said, you know, the one thing that we have to remember is to give grace to our teachers. Um, uh, but what would you say, what else could you say to those teachers that are getting ready for a transition, whether they're going from remote to hybrid or hybrid to in-person or, or the other direction? So on, on top of the grace, um, you have to allow flexibility. And uh, like I mentioned before, uh, expect not to be perfect because in, in reality, this is new for that teacher. It is new also for the district. It is new also for the school. So working together with your uh, grade level partners, with your uh, principal is, is a key. Uh, and, and having that open communication is, is important. Making sure that you also get adept on the technology uh, will also help that teacher. And uh, so the one thing is to uh, bear down, you know, <laughs> uh, make sure that you're prepared uh, when you get into the classroom asking questions and uh, not to be afraid that, uh, um, that, that things may not go your way, but always be prepared to uh, work with each other too troubleshoot those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Isaiah, and what has been one of the, the strategies that, that you have felt um, in working online with students that is your absolute go-to? So if you have students that are struggling or um, they seem like they're kind of reticent. How, how are you able to kind of jump in there and, and help students that, you know, are like, I'm over this. I want to just come back into person. Like, I, I, I want to be face to face. What's something that you've done that has been like so tried and true that you've been able to like help kids kind of nudge themselves along that have been a little bit hesitant? Okay. One, one way is, is, to, is to make them leaders. All right. Um, I know that what we uh, are enforcing or what we are trying to implement in, in the school now is to have student council still occur uh, in a hybrid situation. And having those students who are remote part of that student council, making them involved in the school, even if they're at home, participating in the meetings, participating with ideas, um, and putting, putting their thoughts in the agenda, conducting a meeting, all that uh, kind of infuses and give that kind of school spirit and makes them motivated. Uh, in the classroom, it can be done the same way, to lead a discussion, uh, to give a presentation or to, to help others. Uh, let's say they're in a group, they can manage a, 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 a breakout room and be the group leader and have a discussion with them. But putting them in leadership positions, I think helps them a lot because it gets them out of their shell. Even if you make them in a small group, I think that's something that I like to, to use, especially now. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. So we are about a couple minutes in to eight. And, you know, a lot of people have commented in the chat that they found this extremely informative. I'm, I myself have also found this informative and you presented quite a bit of information here. Where can um, people contact you if they have additional questions for you or for those people that are going to be watching this asynchronously? Right. So, um, so, so thank you for that and for your time. Um, uh, the most one, and this is connected to all my resources, my cell phone especially, it goes right to my other emails. It's forward to all my other emails. So you can email me there at uh, igomes2. Let me see if I can zoom in. igomes2 at njcu.edu. Uh, that is the best resource to, to get me. Uh, I'm not good with phone calls. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the best way to um, reach out to me. 
Excellent. And if um, you would be so gracious to share with us your presentation, if you'd like to do that, um, so people that um, can watch some of these videos again and perhaps use them um, in their own discussions for what would work best depending on the modality in which that they're going to be uh, working with or continuing to work with um, over the rest of this school year and looking into next year. So this has been inc incredibly informative. So I thank you and looks like everybody else is doing so too in the chat for you. So um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll forward it to you so that we can share it. Excellent.